And welcome back, everybody, to The Cube, Silicon Angle's premier broadcast, video broadcast. Uh, we are here at .conf 2012. That is Splunk's annual user conference. We're in Las Vegas at the uh, beautiful Cosmopolitan Hotel. Uh, we will be uh, broadcasting all day today and going to have uh, some great guests. Uh, Continuing now, uh, I'm here joined, of course, with my co-host, Jeff Frick. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Silicon Angle. Thank you. Yes, we, uh, we, again, we've got a great show and a lot of customers today, a lot of, uh, of people using the technology. So next up, we have Rick Yetter from the Apollo Group, uh, probably better known as the, the parent company of the University of Phoenix, which is a, a large and very big growing institution. Yes. Um, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks. We were talking a little bit offline before we got started. Uh, and you were sharing a little bit of numbers about, about the growth of, of, of your guys' use of Splunk. So my question to kind of open us up is explain to us a little bit about you know, why you have such a big data um, flow, kind of how is, does the Apollo Group use all this data, you know, what's generating all this, and then two, kind of how you got started with Splunk and how because of, the, you can explain why you know, the, the use has grown so much over time. So, a little bit of background. Um, I started at Apollo Group about two and a half years ago. We were at a 50 gigabyte license, and the primary use case was to get security information and be able to do some research analysis on security threats, and so on and so forth. Um, when I started using Splunk, we were very quickly interested in seeing what else we could put into Splunk. From there, we started ingesting all of our load balancer information, and our forensics teams, they started using it a lot heavier. So our search times for, um, for load balancer information went from a five day process down to about a 15 minute process on, on some searches. Five days to 15 minutes? Yes, so we're talking needle in a haystack search that you know, for a unique IP address um, for different fraud analysis. And our developers started getting involved in Splunk and they were very interested in putting their application logs in Splunk. So from there, we took the step up to about a half terabyte of log data. So then we were putting in information from systems, um, all the security data, all of the load balancer information. And we, we quickly started realizing that there was a lot of business intelligence located in these logs. So the combination of security information, load balancer information, painted a, a true picture of, of how our users were behaving. Not only our customers, but also how the um, the employees of Apollo Group were, were behaving as far as you know internet usage and so on and so forth. So from there, we had um, we had launched our iPhone application for our University of Phoenix, and then we were working on launching the Android application. So that was our time to shine with Splunk. We were we took the the Android application and we installed it throughout the entire application stack, and on launch day we had zero faults. We had no outages, it was a perfect launch. However, we were able to circumvent some problems before it affected any of the users. Well, at the same time, we had three levels of visibility. We had an executive view that showed um, you know, critical timeouts, any sort of dependency timeouts, and then Android versus iPhone use usage. Mm -hmm. And our executives walked into the war room and saw that, they were like, wow. We need this. We need this on everything. All of our applications need this kind of visibility. So that pushed us to the five terabyte mark. When when was that? When was that event? So that event was in October of last year. Okay. And it was an exciting time. It was a, a lot of fun um, to see the adoption of Splunk go from just a small group of security, a small group of application analysts or developers, all the way up to a broad spectrum of business users, um, reporting users system admins across the board. So we now have about 450 users in Splunk. Wow. That's impressive. I mean, uh, I, I particularly like the, the, the part of the story where the executives came in and kind of were wowed by, uh, yes. by the things you were doing. And that kind of brings up the question that we hear a lot in big data scenarios is kind of, and this is not necessarily unique to big data, but the communication between the IT side and the, and the business side is sometimes uh, strained yes. uh, when it comes to <laughs> technology, <laughs> to say the least. Yes. Um, and, but in big data, it's particularly important because, especially with a tool like Splunk, where you're discovering all sorts of diff different uh, ways to solve business problems, not necessarily just IT problems. Right. So how do you approach that at, at, at uh, the Apollo Group in terms of making sure that, the, that you're getting the most out of your big data infrastructure and tools and applications, Splunk included, uh, between the business and the IT? 
So it, it's it's a socialization process. You know, you, you you start socializing Splunk from the lowest levels all the way up. Um, it, it's very difficult to find an organization that has an adoption from the top down for a tool like Splunk. I, and, and just like you know, any other monitoring tool that you have out there, you know, the HP Open Views, you have Tivoli monitoring. Um, if you don't have a, a top-down mentality, it's, it's very hard to swim upstream. So our battle has been getting it socialized among the developers, managers, and directors as something that is necessary for the operations of the company. And so our, our operations staff, they have multiple dashboards up of Splunk um, that shows critical information on how many users are logging in from, um, from around the world. We have geographic IP information that is displayed in our operation center. And so when there's an outage, Splunk is the first tool that they go to. They start looking at logs in real time to figure out what happened, why, why is the situation occurring. Um, so that kind of visibility helps out with the you know, executive staff saying, this is a great tool. You know, an outage that it would have taken an hour to two hours to circumvent has now been dropped down to 15 minutes. So that, that's, that's the real big thing is that if you're using Splunk in the correct manner, it will get the right visibility. Interesting. So in terms of, it sounds like you've seeded it pretty well and, and, and people are happy and they're seeing some, some business value. Yes. In terms of extending forward and kind of looking forward now that you've got some experience with it and you've got some executive buy-in and everyone kind of buys it, you know, this, this is a cool tool. Where do you see it going next? Are you, are you doing any of your own application development on top of it? Do you see some, some neat things here in the partner pavilion that you would like to, uh, to leverage or kind of, what's your, not long-term vision, because we're in the internet age, there's no super long-term vision, <laughs> right. but you know, the next six months, next 12 months, where do you see uh, taking this tool to the next level? Um, for us, I think our vision is going into Splunk for VMware, Splunk for Active Directory, Splunk for Exchange. Uh, those three apps right there will provide a lot of insight to some are problematic areas. Uh, right, right now, that our service desk does a lot of work in Active Directory, and it's hard to see everything in one view. And so Splunk will give that visibility and the ability to have an audit trail of any changes that are made to Active Directory, as well as, ex as Exchange. So the applications that are developed by Splunk, as well as the partners, are, are very good. And in my presentation today, I say, you know, they're about 80% there. So when you drop an application into your environment, it takes some configuration to customize it to what, what you need it to do. But, you know, for the most part, they're, they're very well written. Uh, so, yeah, so talk a little bit more about the community um, that's, you know, built up around Splunk. I think they, they Splunk really makes a, a concerted effort to include their customers in both the development process, but also just kind of in the whole culture of the company. Right. Um, talk a little bit about what you're seeing here at the show, but, you know, more uh, broadly, how does that community help you do your job better and make the most of Splunk and, and the other tools and applications you're using internally? The the company itself, so Splunk as, as a company is a great company to work with and to partner with, but the community is very supportive of everything. So if you run into a problem, you can go to Splunk Answers and there is usually an answer for every one of your problems, whether it be a small problem or a big problem. If you need help parsing out a line of code, just throw it out on Splunk Answers and someone will, will say, hey, just do this, this, and this, or try this. And so the collaboration between the community is, is better than I've ever seen from any sort of tool out there. So, you know, a little bit of my background, I've been doing, I did Tivoli for about 12 years. Tivoli was a very difficult pro, uh, product to work with, but the community wasn't as supportive as Splunk's community. So, like at Splunk Lives, you can sit there and talk to people, different customers that are running into the same issues or have similar environments and you just you know bring up a topic, and they're very open to talking to you about it. So that it's it's a it's a very cool environment to be in, and it's a very exciting um, product to work with. Yeah, it's it's an interesting combination of of having you know kind of a, of a new way to do software in terms of the download to get started, right? And then also supporting it with this community to really get out. And you never used to hear that about kind of old classic ERP or you know, kind of big applications. They were right. very siloed. There wasn't really a lot of community. It's like, here it is. It's hard. You know, buy some training. Um, 
but there wasn't this, you know, let's get together over beers at an event like a Spunk Live and, and really kind of hash through some of the oh, some exactly. issues I'm having, what have you seen, et cetera. Yeah. And, it, it's, 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 uh, it, it, and I don't know how much of that kind of comes from kind of the social aspect of the software world that we're all involved with, with, with Facebook and this or that, or, you know, it, it, but it is a concerted effort to put that into the culture and to put that into the, the ecosystem right. with the partners and, and with the, uh, the service providers and, and then ultimately the customers as well. Yes. Well, also internally um, at Apollo Group, you know, we're seeing a widespread adoption from the developers, and so they're developing their own dashboards, they're developing their own searches, and it, it's it's great to see that because they actually will collaborate with each other on helping each other out on, on their individual problems. So you might have an application that is having an issue with the JVM, and another application and a set of developers might be having the same problems. So they'll actually get together and start hashing out their own problems, looking through Splunk, and, and working together on that to come to a solution. So it's, it's actually a really good, um, I would say it's a more of a social developing tool right. than anything else. Yeah, interesting. So in terms of uh, you know, the disruption that Splunk is, is creating in the business intelligence data warehousing uh, market, I mean, it's really, in big data in general, Splunk specifically, right. it's a new way of, of analyzing and processing, storing data. It's, it's not as rigid as the kind of the old way. It's a much more flexible mm -hmm. and agile to, to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, yeah, I'm curious to get your uh, perspective of, as you've been in the industry for a long time, what, what, what kind of disrupting uh, patterns are you seeing, uh, not just Splunk, but big data in general, and this whole notion of, you know, let's, let's take advantage of all our data, let's do it on the fly, let's you know, not have to model it ahead of time. How have you seen that transition, and, and how does that fit into what, what you guys are doing? So from a, a disruptive standpoint, I'd say that Splunk is probably the most disruptive technology out there for big data. Uh, you know, a lot of the traditional big data warehouses work on specifically formatted data that fits into a nice little box. Well, big data, by definition, doesn't fit into a small box. It fits everywhere. It comes from everything. Every computer has it. Every device has data. When you combine all of that, it doesn't fit into a little box. So when you have something like Splunk where you can just do a search for a keyword and come up with, you know, 15,000 lines of related information, that makes it disruptive because you can actually correlate and you can view all of that information in one view. You know, at traditional big data warehouses, you don't have that, that ability to do that. You know, for example, if you have um, a student that logs in at University of Phoenix and you type in their username, you can see every step that they take through the application from firewall to load balancer to application to database all the way back out and get individual timings all the way back. So that kind of information is, is very important to our developers to know what classes the users are taking, where are they from, what's their you know, retainment, how long have they been lo logging in. You know, so that, that kind of information is really good for Apollo Group to know, you know how their students are doing and what their demeanor is and how long they're staying in the classes. Interesting, I mean, were, are there any uh, examples you could share with us of some really in interesting correlations or insights you've been able to gather because now you have this view and can uh, basically cross-check data against many different sources of other types of data. And what are some of the, the real kind of insights that you just never could have uh, imagined before? So a, a really good use case was showing the adoption of Android versus iPhone mm -hmm. and also showing which classes were more widely adopted online versus, um, or on mobile platform versus traditional online. And so we can actually see that, um, you know, humanities and the non-technical classes are mostly being taken on mobile platform versus from a desktop. So, really? our, yeah, so our business people can actually sit there and say, okay, well, let's market this towards this group of people, right. or let's market this towards this group of people. And this is not just the registration for the classes, this is the actual taking of the classes. Absolutely. Um, and you can see that breakdown by type of class versus platform that they're yes. actually consuming the content. Yep, that's pretty awesome. I mean, we can, we can do a lot of things with Splunk. Yeah, that, that, is, that is amazing. It's funny, the, the, you know, again, we're here at theCUBE. 
at Splunk 2012. We invite you to join the conversation. The hashtag is data journey. And, and it's, it's amazing to me, all the people that we've had on, Jeff, have gone on a data journey. The fact that, as you just said, Rick, that you can kind of discover things that you couldn't discover before, that you type in a couple of keywords and you right. get some interesting correlations that come out and that, that you can then, again, go on this discovery journey to find out what is meaningful, what isn't meaningful. Yep. It seems to be, uh, you know, kind of a spot on, a spot on theme for the show that really um, illustrates what people are doing and what the technology enables. Absolutely, and that example you just provided, I think, is a good one because it, it shows the, uh, you know, these aren't just necessarily IT decisions; these are business decisions that it's impacting. Right. Um, which is, you know, taking it to a whole new level. Yes. Uh, you know, certainly not to diminish the importance of the IT decisions, but when you're getting to the point where, you know, other uh, groups within the company are making key decisions based on. Uh, a tool that it was initially brought in potentially for security or IT monitoring specifically. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just getting them much more value out of your investment yes. and it's really helping the whole business. Yes, it is, definitely. And, and are you seeing too kind of the, the other, you know, kind of knock on big data, I guess, not, not really a knock, but limitation is, you know, who can really use it, who can really interact with it, who can really drive it. And you, you know, you're explaining pretty simple, straightforward tech searches and, and, right. and, and getting access to this stuff. So our, our, probably one of our another big steps that we're going to take is integration into Hadoop, as well as some of our business, uh, our data warehousing. So we're looking at integrating with multiple databases, pulling information out, and also integrating with our CMDBs. So we have a lot more intelligence behind, behind the logs. And so you know, our data journey has gone quite a distance in the last two and a half years. But over the next two and a half years, we can do some amazing things. Wow, that's great. So thanks again, Rick. No really problem. appreciate you coming on. So again, it's Jeff and Jeff on theCUBE at the Splunk Conf 2012. Uh, theCUBE is SiliconANGLE's premier video event where we go out to the, the tech events, we talk to the people you want to hear from, we, have, we get the information that you want to hear, we go right to the insight. Uh, beyond the press release, beyond the prepackaged stuff, and just have a conversation with people and learn about how they're using these technologies. So we are going to uh, take a break and we're informed by the crew that they're going to feed us. So that's good, Jeff. I don't want you to uh, pass out for lack no, of nourishment. We don't want so that So we're going to take about a 20 minute break, but we do have a bunch of exciting folks lined up for the balance of the afternoon. So we hope to see you back later.